Okay, I guess so. So let's start. Uh, great having you here. Uh, welcome everybody to the Bees Without Borders conference. My name is Andre Wermelinger. Uh, I'm the founder of Free the Bees and your ceremony master for this conference tonight here in Switzerland. Morning uh, at Michael's place and somehow uh, one hour before at uh, David's place. <clears throat> we have a simultaneous translation, uh, two translators tonight, and uh, thanks a lot for uh, translating tonight. And I will quickly explain in French and in German how to change the language channel and then talk again in English. So just give me a little minute, please. Good for all the deutschen Gäste. We have a simultan übersetzung. Uh, vielleicht habt ihr sie schon gesehen, uh, das ist so ein kleiner Button unten, nennt sich Dolmetschen und ist so ein Symbol mit einer Weltkugel. So, ihr könnt dort die Übersetzung wählen und wenn ihr Probleme habt, dann sagt das bitte kurz im Chat. Pour les participants francophones, uh, peut-être que vous avez encore pas remarqué, on propose une tradu traduction simultanée, uh, ça s'appelle Interprétation, vous pouvez choisir le bouton en dessous avec le globe terrestre et vous allez entendre toute euh, la conférence en français. Et si vous avez des problèmes, euh, n'hésitez pas de nous demander dans le chat, il y a quelqu'un du team qui va vous aider. All right, so welcome back again and uh, I hope now you can hear everything in the right language channel. The Bees Without Borders conference uh, has the honeybee and other pollinators uh, in its center. And we promote scientific knowledge and practi practically approved experience. And so we aim to create awareness and understanding of bees in the natural environment with all the complex ecological interdependencies. So these conferences, they are organized by Free the Bees in Switzerland in collaboration with Honey Bee Wild in Luxembourg and Apis Arborea in the USA and the Natural Beekeeping Trust in the UK. So it's kind of collaboration. Uh, we do all this together. And <clears throat> the conference is uh, international and translated uh, in two Darren languages. Darren Goff to finish with 642. Could you please stop or mute your microphone? Thank you. Okay, and uh, we have each month different topics, different speakers, uh, and please keep informed about uh, the future conferences. Uh, we have already had uh, two, uh, two other conferences, a very interesting one tonight, and uh, there will be others in, in the near future, which will be of interest. So now, a uh, warm welcome to our speakers, uh, David and Michael. Uh, welcome to this conference. And uh, someone still has the microphone not muted, so please mute your microphone. So, David and Michael, thank you for being here tonight and share your knowledge and experience with us. I know you both, uh, you have an enormous knowledge and enormous uh, experience. And uh, I'm personally, I'm very interested in listening to you. David, uh, David Heath was one of my very first mentors in beekeeping, uh, right after I have decided to follow the methodology of Emil Varé. And uh, David has an impressive knowledge linked together with lots of experiences and an enormous scientist, scientific practical database on his uh, website, which uh, helped me really uh, a lot. And I had the great opportunity of visiting him at his own place some three years ago. And I'm especially impressed by his success 
unfortunately in Switzerland, I'm not even able to come close to his results. And this will probably be another interesting topic once to take the parallels between the UK, what you do over there and uh, what we uh, see in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, David will tell you all the rest. Uh, you might want to know about himself. He can do it better than I can do anyway. And then we have Michael Bush. Uh, he will present the ecologic, uh, ecology of the bee colony and the impact of beekeepers' treatments. And Michael, he was also one of my very first uh, sightings in published articles. At this time, I didn't know much about bees uh, and about bee science, but his concept of the ecology of the hive with not only bees, but with plenty of insect species, plenty of mites, microbes, fungi, and bacteria seemed to be just logical to me and somehow in harmony with my knowledge about the human gut health. And his work uh, impressed me since the very first beginning in this uh, beekeeping. So a personal remark, please pay attention to the analogies of Michael's speech to the human health. I guess and I think that mankind has never lived in times where this knowledge was of greater importance than nowadays. So I guess what Michael has to tell you or will tell you is of quite big importance to human health uh, too, especially in these days. Okay, so I have the pleasure to give the word to David. David, you have some uh, 45 minutes to talk. Uh, we will need to stop uh, quite hard after these 45 minutes due to the interpreters uh, and then give the, the participants some uh, 10 minutes uh, for questions to you. David, great having you here, thank you. Well, thanks, Andre, for uh, inviting me, and thanks to the whole Bees Without Borders team who are organizing this event. I'm just switching over to uh, share screen, if I can find the thing. Uh, a bit. Can people see my um, slideshow? Looks good. Okay, let's go with that. Let's move that to one side. So um, I'm going to talk about my own beekeeping experiences over the past many years. Um, they, it's a very small scale that my beekeeping um, involves, probably never more than 20 or something colonies. And now it's more like around the 10 or a dozen colonies. But I've found over the years that it works without treating the bees for Varroa. And that's been a, a main interest for, for me for quite a long time. And uh, I'm going to just make a few suggestions or show you how I have arrived at it and make a few suggestions of how perhaps you, if you are treating, could uh, move away from treating and yet um, find it's successful. One thing it is though, um, it's always risky. If you've been a treater and you, um, and you start not treat, there is always a risk that you will lose a lot of bees. And sometimes I warn beginners that they should seriously consider treating say they have got only one or two colonies and if the colonies die it's quite shattering experience for them especially at the beginning of their beekeeping so i often warn beginners uh, or people considering switching to seriously consider treating um, even if it's at a, a lower level less intensive uh, perhaps using biotech biotechnical methods uh, rather than chemicals. So there I leave you at the beginning with this warning uh, before I go on and describe my own beekeeping experience. I started in 2003 
and I just started with the ordinary uh, national hive, which is uh, the commonest hive in Britain. I'm pointing to one in the distance in this apiary of mine. Uh, quite a simple hive. It's the UK's equivalent, perhaps, of the Langstroth for the USA. It's the commonest hive in, in this country. And I'm not sure whether you can see the frame, but the National Hive has 11 frames like this um, and uh, a brew box of about nine inches deep. And I carried on with the National High for several years, doing everything the way I was taught by my mentor. Uh, that included treating and included swarm control and so forth. But after a, a year or two, I started to feel that it wasn't quite natural what I was doing. And I started to look for a way of making it more natural. Uh, one of the things I did with my national hive was to put um, starter strips and allow the bees to make their own comb rather than having foundation in the hive. Uh, and that worked very well. Certainly, you know, the bees were able to do a, a good job care, as, I, as long as I carefully managed it. But that was already a step towards having no frames uh, no, no movable combs, uh, and I discovered the Wari Hive at some point in 2006, and I made half a dozen of them late in that year. And I've been doing my beekeeping with Wari Hives ever since 2007, when I populated six hives, and since then I've added two or three other hive types to my beekeeping, but uh, really just more as experiments. One of them is the modified golden hive, as it's come to be called in Britain, called the golden hive because it's based on the golden section or golden ratio, and um, has frames which are like dadent or dadon frames rotated through 90 degrees. And its um, German name is the Einraumbeuter. Um, mine is modified by having double walls and a warre type roofing system and with a quilt inside and so forth. Slightly better uh, insulated than the usual Einraumbeuter. So I've only got one of those and that's populated at the moment. I've also got a modified Lazutin based on ideas of Fedor Lazutin, who died only a few years ago in his 40s of a, of a brain tumour. Um, he's a Russian, uh, was a Russian beekeeper, wrote a lovely book, um, uh, Keeping Bees with a Smile, rather ambiguously titled, and he describes these hives with very large frames, uh, which I've made myself, uh, based on the Dadant frame, actually, like almost double depth Dadon friends. And also, I have a reed hive which was sent to me by David Juncker in Germany um, called the Schilftrog in Deutsch. And it's a curious looking creature. Uh, it's got bees at the moment. It seems to be doing extremely well. Um, its wall. Uh, U-shaped wall is uh, made of reeds, the ends are wood with cork on the outside, and it's got U-shaped frames inside. Um, very interesting hive, it was a present from David, and of course I wanted to try it out. So I've got these three trot hives, um, Einraum Boiter, um, the Zutin, and, and the, um, the reed hive, plus one national that survived I kept one national, just sort of, I don't know, it's almost um, just keeping one foot in the in the conventional beekeeping world. Um, also, if an inspector comes to my apiary and wants to go through my bees, they've got several frame hives that they could inspect, but the worry hive is much more difficult to inspect because it has fixed comb. Here are a couple of my worry hives. I've got uh, eight 
thing at the bakery, which is my home or nearest to my home bakery, I've only got one. Um, I used to have eight acres scattered around the district. Now I've reduced it to four. They have one or two or three worry hives in. So here's an example of one. And Worry's book um, came to our attention in 2006. And in 2007, my wife Pat and I decided to translate it into English. It hadn't it had never been done. And um, we put it on the internet for free and it attracted such a lot of interest. Beekeepers started asking us for print versions of the book, which um, Northern Bee Books very kindly decided to do. In fact, they approached us and said, please, could we publish it in print? So there is the resulting print version. And the, type, the cover picture on this is a convenient thing for explaining a worry hive function to anybody who's not familiar with it. Um, it has a, a floor just of boards nailed onto a couple of battens and a slot cut in the floor so the bees can get in underneath the rim of the bottom box. The boxes are about 210 millimeters deep, each one fitted with eight top bars, which you can just about see in this picture. And on top of the topmost box is what's known as a top bar cloth, which could be made of canvas, burlap, hessian, or whatever something substantial. And on top of that is what Worry called a coussin, which we've interpreted as a quilt, uh, a term commonly used in beekeeping, which is a box containing wood shavings as a kind of insulation. And then on top is the rather uh, um, typical Worry roof, which is ventilated under its eaves and through its gable end. So that's the Worry Hive. And basically you start the Worry Hive by putting the colony into a couple of boxes and they bees start to build under the top bars or the topmost box and gradually they move down. When they're into the second box you add a third box and the hive grows like that up to a maximum. Well Warry had no more than seven boxes on, on his hives. Um, after that it gets rather difficult to stop it blowing over in the wind. And here in the early editions of Warry's book he had um, lots of photographs of him and his assistant, uh, I'm not sure who she is, um, working on the hive. And uh, always in the photos, his dog Polo is sitting at his feet. We wonder whether that's to illustrate that the bees in the worry hive uh, are a lot more calm and docile than, than in other hives which are inspected rather frequently. And while we're on this photograph, just notice these little things here which are box stands when you instead of putting a box on the ground you haven't got a roof quite as convenient like on a national so you can rest it on this and this and it's designed to minimize crushing bees so the worry hive just gives you an idea of what it looks like when it's developed into its third box it's a, this is a an acrylic hive that was made for an exhibition in, uh, in Germany at Apimondia many many years ago so this is a rather well-developed colony. Um, the hive was taken up by a number of manufacturers around the world. This particular one by Thorn um, in the United Kingdom, which is the biggest uh, hive equipment supplier. Rather nicely made in cedar wood, and, um, but otherwise meets the normal worry standard. I think they were done while windows in the back. And I was so keen to get my first warriors with bees in uh, that I, instead of waiting for a swarm to turn up, I did um, artificial swarming into my first worry. So these are the these are the three box worry. In fact, you see the handles on the boxes, and you can see straight away that the national hive is a much bigger, wider format than the worry. So to get the connection between the two, I put a, an adapter board on the top of Warry. On top of the adapter board, I put a queen excluder. And what's happened here is that I have shook swarmed all the bees from the national through a funnel down into the Warry. And then I put on the adapter board and queen excluder and the brood box, which by then would have hardly any bees in. And then I left it for an hour or two, 
for the nurse bees to climb up through the queen excluder into the brood box and repopulate the combs of brood. And uh, that worked very nicely. I did the first two of my worry hives like that. And all the rest I've done since then have been populated by putting a swarm in. Here's just a picture of the equipment used in, in warrior beekeeping. The difference is primarily this uh, comb night. Occasionally, if one has to remove a comb, for instance, an inspector wants to check your, your hive's health, you need this L-shaped tool here um, and conveniently a, a stand to put the comb on so that the ends of the top bars rest on these two uprights here. And in the background, you can see a cheese wire when in the winter or in the autumn, when you're preparing uh, the colony for winter, you may want to separate boxes. And sometimes it's advisable to run a cheese wire between, the, between two boxes in case there's binding between the combs in one box with the top bars in the box below. So this is a, a cheese wire. Actually, it's fishing line that I use as the wire. And here, just to prove that the worry hive is an inspectable hive, here is one of our national bee inspectors looking at a comb resting on the comb support. And he's inspecting it with a flashlight because he can't do what most bee inspectors do and tilt the comb and rest it against his abdomen. A lot of them do that. They see the, the dirty mark across there. Uh, not the most hygienic thing. And um, so he's inspecting it on the comb support, and uh, that seems to work okay. It, it's only if the combs get crossed does it become really pro problematic, which occasionally does happen. Really. Even though you prepare the top bars either with a V or a T shape or with a, a bead of wax one, one along the middle, uh, sometimes the combs will cross from between one top bar and another. Uh, and that makes inspection rather more difficult. So here's a worry hive that's been occupied for some time. And you can see that the top bar cloth has got propolis on it in between the top bars. Um, we know how important propolis is for colony health. So that's something we want to encourage. Worry said he changed his top bar cloths every year. Well, I, I don't. I like mine covered in propolis and plenty of it. So I don't change mine every year. I don't any longer um, practice swarm control. I used to use um, reactive swarm control in that I inspected my colonies about every eight days uh, or nine days. And I would then, if I saw uh, occupied queen cells, I would take precautions to split the hive and avoid using a swarm. Nowadays, I don't do that. I let my colonies swarm. But I do practice swarm management in the sense that I've got at the moment about 10 bait hives to mop up any swarms that, that are going. Of course, I probably don't get all of them, and I probably get a few feral swarms coming in from tree colonies in the district, which there are several. So this is just one, in, one bait hive high up on the back of our house, close up with scouts at the entrance. And for the neighbours, it's quite a spectacular experience. Suddenly the air is full of bees coming into the bait hive. Um, and so far, no uh, serious complaints, just a, a bit of surprise. And the, the worry hive, it's not a, it, it could perhaps be made into a commercial hive and certainly is being in an area of fantastic nectar flows, like in New South Wales, Australia where um, the worry hive format is being used commercially highly successfully. Uh, but generally, certainly in the UK, people who eat worry hive are not expecting to get large honey um, surfaces. However, you do get them. Um, generally, we harvest a whole box at a time rather than frames or whatever. There's no supering. Um, the, the top box of the hive, or the top two boxes if you're lucky, but that's, that's an exceptional season uh, when it's full of honey is taken off. Now you can see then, if you're wagering, in other words,
it's adding boxes underneath and taking off um, honey from the top, you're actually causing a turnover of comb. And the comb is constantly being renewed. And this is a one uh, hygienic feature of the worry hive in that the bees are getting uh, new comb and old comb is being removed at the top. Um, while we're on the subject though, uh, somebody would obviously point out that this comb uh, could have been used uh, for rearing brood. Uh, now it's got honey in and that may not be uh, particularly good. But um, it's been shown that uh, X brood comb honey fetches a higher premium uh, when people, when it's put on the market, partly because it's got a very good flavor. Um, <clears throat> and you can buy it from possibly, I'm not sure whether he sells overseas from Tim Malfoy in, in Australia. I've had some of his honey and it's delicious. So all you need for information on worry beekeeping could be found for free on this internet portal here. But there's a link to also the book and where you can buy it if you want to buy this book. Um, that gives you uh, sort of access to all the material. Um, so I'm really worried to translate it into English. After a few years, I was asked why uh, Jerry Burgess of the Burbage of um, Northern Bee Books to write a book called Natural Beekeeping of the Worry Hive and make it a purely practical manual. So not a big book, but just keeping to the details of how to do it. And that's, that's uh, the front of that book. So let's move on now. I get an image on my screen saying your internet connection is unstable. Um, I stopped treating in 2009 on my nationals, but when I populated my worries in 2007, I didn't use any acaricides, any miticides. Ever since then, all my worry beekeeping has been without treatment. And there was already plenty of information around by then that these miticides were not doing much good for the honeybee itself. Um, and actually they weren't always brilliantly effective, but um, anyway, I, I gave up that and, and didn't know whether other people were doing that until quite a bit later, in fact, 2011, I discovered that several people in my district had become closet non-treaters, that, that they just stopped treating. Um, this was against advice of the UK National Bee Unit that still holds that you should treat your bees uh, against varroa. So um, I was embarking into the unknown, thinking I might lose an awful lot of bees. Um, I just put up this paper here. Um, Tehelka has done a very thorough review of the damaging effect of all the various acaricides on the honeybee. And uh, I won't go into any detail of all those because um, you'll find plenty of material in Michael Bush's talk, which will be coming after mine. Um, and I just to uh, mention a recent uh, paper has come out showing that even formic acid, which has been uh, argued as relatively mild treatment, uh, can cause uh, noticeable damage. And so here's this paper that's from Ireland, from Mary Coffey's group in Ireland, showing uh, proteomic alterations, changes in the proteins, uh, protein profiles in, in, the, in the colonies. So there's plenty of information that will tell you that it's not good for the bees to be treating them. So I said I embarked on this uh, unknown of not treating, wondering whether I'd lose everything. And <clears throat> I had mixed results at the beginning, 45% losses in the second year, 66.7% loss, losses in the third year. But as time went on, um, the overall losses were tolerable. My average is about 15% at the moment. So um, I, was, I was satisfied. I decided that the experiment had worked. I could say that treatment-free was possible. 
And I, I must admit, I had been encouraged by hearing stories of treatment for beekeepers in the United States who found it worked for them. Um, it wasn't totally unknown. Um, it was just less common in the UK, but in the, in the USA, there were already quite a lot of treatment free beekeepers. And beside my results here, I present the, the year by year the results for the British Beekeepers Association. And notice that there's no statistically significant difference between, although their figure is slightly higher. And actually, um, earlier on in this, most of them, well, still most British Beekeepers Association contributors to their survey on hive losses are treaters. So it rather suggests that treating is no great advantage in terms of colony loss over the winter. Um, now, the uh, a year ago, the loss rate, sorry, the number of non-treaters was about 14%. But in 20, 2021, two years ago, it was 14%. 2021, it's 27%. Uh, and not treaters. So the number's gone up, but it's still a majority of treaters. And you can see that there's obviously no great advantage to treat. We should say, though, this is the UK. It's not all over. You heard Andre's message that um, treat, going without treatment is not uh, quite so easy in Switzerland. Um, tell you a bit about my colony life history is so that here we have the, the hive number of each colony six for going through last winter. Um, and these are colonies that have been through one winter. The age of each colony in this row here, second line, notice some of them uh, well over 10 years. And um, my national is nearly six years old, five years old, short, sorry. Um, whereas my modified lazutin and reed hive were only populated last year, and I've only just repopulated my um, golden hive, I now pointer, uh, <clears throat> with a swarm. And that's the average colony age of all colonies, 63 months, five, over five years old. Now, how can I say these colonies are 10 or 12 years old? That seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Well, I measure colony age from the moment I put a swarm in an empty hive to the point where it can no longer sustain itself, replace its own queen if the queen fails um, without in artificial intervention. And I don't intervene artificially. I do not artificially be queen. Also, my hives are inspected frequently. So I can also rule out um, <coughs> usurpation by incoming swarms, which change a hive which is failing to uh, a hive that's actually um, <clears throat> suddenly mysteriously become very active again. Um, uh, Tom, it's unusual to do this colony ages. So, um, Tom Seeley does this, uh, usually with only two or three visits to his bee trees uh, each year. So he can attach colony ages to, uh, and also he finds that some of them live for, for many years. There's quite a range there. So, um, yeah, uh, one of my reasons for doing this was uh, I was re always reading in official literature or scientific literature that uh, bees that are not treated die out within three years. Well, I, I quite soon found that that wasn't the case. Uh, and, and obviously these figures rather suggest it's not necessarily true. Of course, um, <clears throat> I should say this is um, a particular habitat, a particular country, and so on and so on. Particular bees, perhaps, uh, may not apply in all places. Um, you can see from this chart here that my colonies are not short of deformed wing virus. Uh, the, uh, the, the colonies were analysed by Jessica Kevill, who was working with Steve Martin at Salford University at the time. So on the left, you've got uh, a thousand, this is a billion, American billion, a thousand million uh, copies of the virus, 10,000 million and so on. And um, 
the uh, obviously there are uh, a high levels uh, so it can't be the fact that i've got no virus virus is one of the, the biggest problems the virus is carried by varroa uh, and um, spread around from, with the, from the bees with varroa and uh, it's it's a big problem but uh, my bees are surviving despite the fact these high titers as the term technical term is uh, of um, deformed wing virus that was 2016 and also from the group steve martin's group at salford uh, a year or two later i had a visit from george martin um he uh, george hawkins sorry who um took out some brood comb for my colonies to go and study uh, various parameters of, of the um, hygiene, including capping and uncapping and uh, varroa reproduction. And you can see from this slide, this is recapping data, um, brood, brood, brood cell infestation rates in the 8 to 12%. And the, from the overall data, from all his studies of all other beekeepers, you get this chart here on the left, showing that the um, infested cells have uh, a much higher recapping rate than the uh, non-infested cells, these lighter grey. And here you can see that the, um, the same is true even in the non-resistant bees. So these would be from uh, colonies where people are treating. And these are from colonies where people are not treating and supposedly have resistant bees. And on the right, you can see, um, I don't know why this particular colony had such low uh, recapping rates. Um, I, did, I should have asked George at the time, but he's moved on now. Um, but anyway, it's the same story, um, high uh, recapping and um, in, in the uh, infested cells and relatively low recapping in non-infested cells. So the bees are targeting correctly. And you're looking at here three different colonies, National, Rizutin, and Golden. And then he also measured varroa reproduction data and showed that the reproduction was lower in uh, resistant uh, colonies. Uh, compared with non-resistant colonies, these are treated colonies. So as you'd expect, um, that um, the uh, <coughs> um, reproduction is, is, is reduced in, a, in resistant bees, which is what you would expect. And the three colonies here, those are the, that's the overall data, by the way, as it just does with the last slide. This is my colony's data. And varroa reproduction is, you know, if you average all these three, it's about like, like here. So it's about like resistant colonies level. And work by Steve Martin's group is uh, put together and summarized in this nice little publication available from the British Beekeepers Association from the Prince, for the princely sum of four pounds and it's, it's quite a detailed booklet. Uh, a quote from it, elevated recapping levels in a population is currently the best indication of a non uh, a naturally below resistant population. So you could do this as a way of testing a population that you, where your bees are derived from. And, um, in this, you get detailed method for testing. Uh, and it's a sort of technology that you could do at least working out the recapping. Uh, working out the mite reproduction is a little bit more difficult. Um, and a lot of this requires a binocular microscope uh, would make it a much easier thing, but it's, it's you know, going into the um, finer detail, you, it starts to become more expensive. But at least, at least the recapping could be tested by the average beekeeper. During my um, course, my sort of adventure with non-treatment, I did consider uh, whether 
my bees were would be better off if they were more uh, inclined to be like the British black bee or Apis mellifera mellifera. And so I did wing morphometry on my bees. And on the left, I show the most promising colony that I have. Sadly, not a, a perfect example of Apis mellifera mellifera. And even this bee tree colony, this feral colony or wild living honey bee colony, uh, which looked a little bit better, was still not a perfect uh, example of Apis mellifera mellifera. Of course, um, it would be better to have DNA uh, research done on one's bees that would tell you in even more detail and perhaps more accurately whether uh, your bees are uh, AMM, are black bees or not. Um, I should explain that what you're getting here when you do this wing morphometry, which is comparing lengths of various veins and junctions and so forth, is you get just two parameters here which are plotted on the graph. And if your bee is a black bee, it should fall within this boundary here in, into this rectangle here, which mine did a bit. But the others were much, the other, I did about eight hives at the time, and the others were much worse than that. So I didn't think there was a great future in working for the British black bee, uh, which in some areas is, is the holy grail, there's no doubt about it, down in Cornwall Lake doing well and there's a group in Ireland that's uh, the Republic of Ireland that's doing very well with black bee breeding. And to give you an idea of the colorations of my bees, here's some, uh, some of mine very close to my apiary on Catoni Aster and the banding is clearly deviates from the typical black bee. Although I've had some colonies which are incredibly uniformly uh, black and uh, so, you know, sometimes there's maybe there are black bees in the area um, that, that could be bred up more to uh, be the local bee. Our uh, local association, the Welsh Beekeepers Association, is very keen on people using local bees, not importing. And even now there's voluntary conservation areas being uh, set up around Wales. Um, to minimize the importation of other bees and therefore spoiling the genetic makeup of, um, of the local population. And um, certainly uh, somebody called Dylan Ellen from Belgium has done DNA studies around whales and bee colonies and finds that they um, have a high percentage of Apis mellifera mellifera in their genes. So here I have um, a survey of winter losses in my local county in Wales. Uh, I, as I said, I didn't know other people were stopping treating, but it soon turned out quite a few were. And over a few years, Clive and Sean Hudson were doing um, surveys of beekeepers, painstaking work, phoning them up because not everybody, uh, they say they'll give you, give you the data, but then it doesn't come. So you have to phone them up. So they did all that chasing up work and got quite an impressive number of colony years, uh, be, uh, colony years of, of not treating. And you can see that um, the, uh, <clears throat> the percentage loss for treated is 19% uh, on average over all those years. And uh, I don't know whether it's my, I'll move that out of the way, 13% for not treated. Um, I didn't think there was a statistically significant difference here, but a statistician um, uh, who read the publication of these results in the British Beekeepers Association uh, journal uh, did a statistical analysis of it and found that actually the percentage, um, uh, percentage loss amongst treaters was actually statistically significantly higher if you treat it. Now, that's rather, rather a surprising conclusion from this study. It was only at the 5% level, so, you know, one in, one in 20, so it could have been due to chance. But even so, it was an encouraging result all those years ago. And I've asked Clive since, um, does he think people are still not treating? He said, yeah, nearly everybody. So in Gwynedd, there's this special community of beekeepers that have managed to get away with not treating for some years now. 
um, so much so that it attracted, I think, um, on the mention, a uh, party of 14 people came from Switzerland to uh, meet our association and discuss uh, non-treatment and find out what, what we're doing and how we do our beekeeping here. And that was a pleasant uh, occasion two or three years ago, um, talking to them and, and discussing beekeeping. So that's Gwynedd, the Gwynedd experience. Um, there are various people around Britain who are not treating, Joe and Chris Ibbotson. Uh, what's important is about them is that they're in a very different landscape from, from us here in Gwynedd. Here it's mostly quite hilly, small fields and um, pasture land, mostly pasture land. Whereas they are in arable land over in the east of the country, the drier east. And yet they um, too are having tolerable winter losses, slightly higher than mine, but 18% um, averaged over all these years. And compared with the regional Be British Beekeepers Association result for their region, their losses are no, are no different. So, um, you know, they're, they're getting away with it, just like we are, even though it's a very different region. And then there's Steve Riley's group uh, down at Westerham, 160 treatment free hives in 30 acres, and um, they, uh, they're they getting away with it as two not treating. Um, actually, the lower loss there due to it's only 7%. They have got some biotechnical methods for controlling Varroa, so that's why that's quite a lot lower than the others. Um, for what, I don't know whether I'm coming to the end of my time, but it's now 5.48. I have some uh, five, five more minutes. Five more that's minutes. How much time you give for questions afterwards? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, five minutes should be plenty, I think. Um, so, so you can write down a few factors that might be worth considering if uh, you want to increase the chance of your colony surviving. Um, and I just put a few here which seem promising in relation to Varroa and so surviving Varroa. One of them is the hive virology, whether it's uh, inoculated or not, uh, whether the bees can keep their, their uh, brood warm. Um, one thing it's been shown that uh, Varroa doesn't re reproduce so well in, a, in warmer conditions. So that's a factor, but it also helps the colony survive a harsh winter if it's well protected. If you can consider a tree, tree trunk, the average thickness of, in one study by Tom Seeley found that the average wall thickness of colonies, in, in feral colonies in trees, was 150 millimetres. So, um, our hives are rather pathetic in relation and anything approaching that like my double wall hive with insulation in between it is going at least in the direction of, of, of the uh, natural free living honeybee colony that it's evolved to cope with over millennia. Uh, hive capacity, well Tom Seeley has shown that if your hive is too big it's less likely to swarm Swarming is one way of controlling varroa because of the natural brood break, breaks that are created. So your hive shouldn't be too big. Comb, I considered um, using small cell comb uh, some years ago, went into some detail about it, and eventually decided that um, the bees should really be given the opportunity to make the cell size that they want for their conditions. So I didn't go down that road. Uh, although uh, quite a lot of the people in the United States found that was their way of, of getting a successful treatment-free beekeeping. Local bees, well, a, a big coloss study, uh, that's a consortium of, uh, of bee uh, people, bee scientists and so on, showed that uh, colonies with local queens had a better chance of surviving the winter. So, that seemed to suggest local bees. I, I, the Welsh Beekeepers Association also supports the idea of having local bees. Swarming, well, you can't just always allow swarming. In, in an urban area, that might be highly problematic. I don't know. Uh, I live in a sort of semi-rural area, and it works fine for me, especially with the use of 
um, bay types because any any swarms that I don't need for myself I give away to other beekeepers so it, it, it works nicely I might even create a net reduction in uh, troublesome swarms by having all my 10 bay types uh, operating allow natural queen rearing recent uh, research by um, Chinese group uh, shows that the, uh, the, the queen that's reared from even the youngest larva is, um, is morphologically not normal compared with a queen that's allowed to grow up in a normal queen cell right from an egg uh, at the beginning in a natural way. Allow natural mating. Well, certainly as much mating as possible with drones so that you get a, uh, plenty of polyandry in the hive. Uh, that's been shown to increase colony vigor uh, the more uh, paternal lines you've got in your hive. Colony density. Well, this may be the problem why uh, treatment free in Switzerland doesn't work well because there's, uh, by comparison with here in Wales, there's a huge difference in colony density. Ours is relatively low, uh, but in the Swiss valleys, it can be extremely high. I've already mentioned propolis, plenty of that. Um, you can encourage it by scoring the walls of your hive. You can, uh, you can uh, fit a, a screen that fit a special design to go on the wall, which hugely stimulates propolis production. Or you can even buy hives now with um, grooves milled on the inside walls, especially for populist deposition. And then honey, well, feeding with honey, um, there's no comparison with, with sugar to the syrup. Uh, and minimize interference. I've just put up this chart here. Um, Michael, Michael Bush will, will go into more detail about uh, the, the relatively poverty of sugar solution for feeding. Um, you know, honey's got all these things. Don't need to read all of it. It's a lot of stuff. Uh, sugar's just got carbohydrate. It hasn't even got pH buffering. And that brings me, oh, I should say, by the way, that um, my, my beekeeping uh, has, uh, although I've not treated ever since I started wary hives, um, I do check the colonies in September for whether they've got sufficient winter spores. And if they haven't, I uh, feed with whatever I've got at the time, and it's usually sugar syrup. But I don't just feed it ad lib. I weigh the colony accurately and calculate the quantity of honey stores there. And I make up the stores to uh, nine kilograms altogether. This is vastly below what's recommended by uh, the National Bee Union. Uh, and other you know, local authorities. Um, but I do, uh, I should say that my, my colonies are being stressed with uh, but not by shortage of, of food in winter or of energy in winter. Um, what can I say? Yeah, I did a calculation one winter from weighing hives in uh, the end of October and again at the end of March and looking at the difference. And I found that the uh, amount consumed was about five kilograms. So my nine kilos is really perhaps overkill, um, particularly with wary hives, which are better insulated than, than most nationals. Um, well, I better conclude there and leave some time for questions. Um, I've already mentioned some of the books. Well, that's one on the modified golden hive. Uh, this is my first book, which was um, uh, really looking for all the scientific evidence I could find that justified a more natural way of beekeeping. Um, it's 2010-11, a lot could be added to that now in all the years that have gone since. So that's just my books. Well, thank you all for watching and listening, and I'm open to questions. Thank you, David. Uh, always impressive uh, hearing uh, your results. Uh, very good, thank you. So now we have uh, questions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, let's just take uh, one or the other question. So who would like to ask something to David?
You can either just speak or raise your hand on the reaction button. No questions? So I have one, David. I will start with a question. You said before that viruses are one of the big problems. Uh, do you look at viruses as a symptom or as a cause? Uh, uh, viruses as a symptom or as a... Or, or as a cause, cause. As, as a real source of a problem or just a symptom which comes when the immune system is not really good? Um, you know, I in the case of these bees, I haven't a clue what the answer to that question is um i would be very surprised i mean do you ever find anybody who has no deformed wing virus in their bees it was it's only become relatively problematic since varroa was around so uh, you could say it's a symptom of varroa but it's been more of a challenge to um honeybees because of the presence of varroa causing this um, change in the way the virus is passed on. It's vectored through the mite puncturing the um, uh, the outside of the honeybee. Okay, thank you. So we have one question of Kugo. Hello. Yeah, he's got his hand up. Oh, his, his microphone is muted. You have to wait for the translation. Ah. Pardon. Je voudrais savoir uh, si vous avez expérimenté et ce que vous pensez des planchers complètement grillagés. Ah, you're asking about mesh floors. Um, I used to have mesh floors on all my nationals, and I still have them on one national. But um, I read a paper by uh, the Chaplain in Canada that showed that actually mesh floors could encourage varroa because it created cooler, uh, cooler conditions in the hive and therefore varroa reproduction uh, progressed better uh, to the disadvantage of the bees. Um, so I, I don't use mesh floors on my worries. But having said that, I have got them on two worries at the moment because I'm doing an experiment for a lady in the Czech Republic who believes that um, bees, uh, mites, varroa mites in treated, untreated hives like mine, in, in resistant hives colonies, um, are smaller than those normally. And so she asked me to send her mites so uh, to do that i need a mesh floor underneath to collect the mites and um, i also have been asked to measure the temperature inside the brood nest uh, so i've got monitors in there recording the temperature every 10 minutes in the brood nest and she wants to look at if there's any correlation between that and the mite size uh, so basically i don't i wouldn't normally have mesh floors anymore um, I think it's uh, it's not a great advantage. It's also gives you know it's problematic because the um, wax moth breeds underneath the mesh floor, uh, and the bees can't get at it to clean to get rid of the larvae. Thank you. So I, John, last question. Afterwards, we need to take the break. Ah. Andre, the question was asked about deformed wing virus. I had my my colonies I sent samples of to Jessica Kevill for three years as part of the Martin experiment. And the deformed wing virus level was 95% in the colonies, a lot of it. But there was no sign of deformed wing, physically deformed wing, or varroa dropping. And they, they found that there were three types of virus, alpha, beta, and, and Charlie. And 
the majority were the beta variant, which was reckoned to be a benevolent one, which was in some way um, outcompeting the, the damaging viruses. Um, I've done nothing to them apart. I'd, I can't even detect when they've got virus because all I can see is whether they're deformed wings or, or whether there's varroa dropping. And I only see a very few of those when I examine the floors. Thank you, very good to know. And I guess after the break, Michael will have some very interesting information on such kind of uh, things too. So let's take a break and let's meet again in 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, in my case, it's seven, 17. Uh, so yeah. take 15 minutes uh, for our translators because it's very <laughs> Uh, difficult for translating simultaneously. So give them a break and uh, happy to have you back in 15 minutes. <laughs>